Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Sam with one of the Quack Brothers. We have a very special guest today. We got Brandon, who is a landlord, a bigger success story than, than we are. And Brandon's got over 100 rental units. Uh, he's phenomenal. Uh, we, had, we had an on and off chat uh, off on Facebook, uh, but we never really had a phone call slash a face-to-face -face meeting. So this is actually going to be our first time doing a face-to-face -face type of thing, uh, as you can see, him, he, see here right on the screen. And uh, this is going to be fun. So Brandon, what's going on? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Not a whole lot, just landlord stuff, like always. Right, uh, yeah, and, and be, right before the show, we, I know you had your phone blow up like crazy, uh, like you're Mr. Popular. Um, so go ahead and tell us, like, where, how did you get started in this? What do you do right now? Uh, what's your background story? And uh, I know uh, you had you mentioned that you had a, ra a racks to riches story, uh, which I can relate. I'm, I'm an immigrant myself. So go ahead and start with uh, how did you get started in this, uh, and where you were before your success. Sure, I'll give you kind of the, as brief of a synopsis as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Brandon. I live right outside Columbus, Ohio, uh, so typical Midwest town. Um, my, I started real estate in 2006, but my story starts a little bit before that. Um, I grew up kind of, I say kind of, but, you know, depending on your, your definition of poor, we grew up poor. My dad drove a truck. My mom sold Avon. Um, and I grew up in a situation where my my family and everybody I knew was not financially literate. That's the term I use anymore. Mm. The richest person I knew was an engineer that worked at a TV factory and he made a whopping $45,000 a year. And for me, that was kind of like, that's the bar of rich. And was that, that was the bar of rich in my life growing up. Um, parents just didn't weren't able to save money, things like that. Um, when I was six, our landlord kicked us out or asked us to leave. My mom said, if you do another interview, you can't say kick this out. We don't want him to be mad at us. And this is when I was six. I'm 34 now. So we're talking 28 years ago. She still is afraid. Um, so the landlord asked us to leave. Um, that was kind of weird. My dad, like I said, my dad drove a truck and just never made money. Um, so growing up, time went on. Uh, my dad had a heart attack at 18. And my brother and I had to go get a job. I worked, I ended up working at the Gap Warehouse right outside Columbus in a little town called Groveport, where it's kind of big now. But that's where like all the Amazon distribution is now. But I worked at a typical warehouse making 11 bucks, 10, 11 bucks an hour. I realized pretty quick that I could not live um, like that. Meanwhile, shortly, you know, my dad had that, that heart attack and in the midst of me working at the warehouse, um, our landlord told us to leave because we actually had a oil well. We lived in a little tenant house in the middle of a cornfield. And the landlord thought it would be a great idea, which I would have probably done the same thing, to lease prior to the property out to an oil exploration company. The oil exploration company actually broke um, through the lines leading to our house and it filled up the house with um, oil and natural gas. So Gosh. in the middle of my dad having a heart attack, me getting a job, um, we had to leave that one. Um, we were asked to leave that house too. So uh, my dad had a heart attack, was immobile. I mean, just an absolute disaster. So I, I work at the warehouse for three years. I realized that you can't raise a family, which is always my goal. You know, from a, as poor as we were, we had a, I had a real great relationship. Still do with my mom. My dad didn't mm. pass away here recently. Um, but we had a great family situation. Just we're always poor. Never had money. Never owned our own house. Um, thank God we knew somebody that after the oil well exploded, they let us all live in their little one-bedroom apartment above a coffee shop. Um, so you can imagine a family of four, my brother and I are both 18 by that point, 19 almost living in a little coffee, one bedroom coffee shop, um, just, just a mess. So I decided to get in real estate because it, even in my small town, every real estate agent drives a Cadillac. They have a nice suit and tie, you know, they've got this really nice presence about them. They're really cool. When it's like, man, I should get in real estate that all the people in there are rich. You know, they're not like the people I know, um, they're rich. Um, get in real estate, the state of Ohio requires you go to college or take three weeks of education. I bust that out, get my license back in March, 2006, become a real estate agent. And, you know, I'm immersed in this culture. That's really awesome. But, um, I find out really quick that they're, they're all in debt up to their years. Most of the people are in debt, at least the agents were. And 
um, through that, I start meeting clients and a couple agents. And when I say couple agents, I mean, I mean a couple agents, like two, maybe three agents that I know that are actually kind of wealthy. And I find pretty quickly that they're not in real estate sales, they're in owning property. And I was really blessed to be able to share an office with a while with a guy that was the former CEO of an oil company. And he really changed my perspective on money and wealth trying to do things long term rather than oh well we got to make a quick buck and most of the agents at that time i'm sure they're still no different it was all about getting that commission money getting a quick buck but i started having these guys come to my office then they would say i want to buy a piece of property in this such and such location i can spend one hundred fifty thousand dollars. and as a real estate agent you ask the pre-qualification questions you know have you been pre-approved for a mortgage you know how much money do you have things like that and these people come to my office and they print out bank account statements and they would hand them to me and say, all right, I got 500,000 in the bank. I can spend 150. Um, I want to buy cash. And it just blew my mind knowing that there were human beings out there in my town, in outside Columbus, in Columbus that had, five, you know, mid six figures in their account. I also met a guy that drove a truck just like my dad. His wife worked at the courthouse doing paperwork for the government just like my mom did before I was born. Um, they had kind of a similar situation to my parents, but he came to me and he said, I want to buy a house um, to flip. And I said, okay, you know, those are hard to get mortgages for. Blah. I gave him the speech, you know, that I gave everybody. He said, no, no, here's my bank account statement. I've got $350,000 cash that I'm willing to use to buy a, a place to flip. And it was just like, you have the exact same, I mean, very similar background to my parents, but you have tons of money. So I kept asking these people, and the one thing they all had in common was they owned real estate rather than um, selling it real, selling it. And that was after two, maybe three years of being real estate. I realized that, man, I've got to figure out how to own real estate rather than just selling it for other people. And it took me from like 2007, 2008-ish, 2009, you know, my, the first few years of me being in real estate till 2013 to start buying rentals. Um, then I kind of cracked the code, as you would say, and I figured out I don't have to have $100,000 to buy real estate. I just have to figure out how to negotiate and deal with people. And, you know, I've been in real estate for long enough. I kind of can talk to people. I can kind of negotiate, um, figured out maybe I should just start asking people, hey, would you go in with me? Would you start investing with me on real estate? Um, and then just, you know, went out and bought, uh, talked to, talked to some people, uh, about investing in some foreclosures with me, bought a little foreclosure, well, not a little foreclosures, a six bed, two bath full of mold. And we spent twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 on it. And over the, uh, from July, 2013 to December, we fixed it, put 20, 25,000 in it mm -hmm. at 50, 55,000 and rented it for a thousand dollars a month. And you know, I knew that I could be successful rent with rentals being in real estate. I know what the cost is of things, but I also realized I can talk to people and have them go in with me or loan me money. Even though I don't have a lot of money to my name, I can negotiate and set these deals up. So since 2003, I've net, I've bought, purchased 39 rentals. Three of them are laundromats. I own like 32 houses, like freestanding actual houses. The rest are multifamilies, and then we're supposed to close on a multi-multi-million dollar project tomorrow. The next project will push me way over 100 units. I can jive with what you're saying because you know I come from this. I come from a similar background, although you know I'm, I'm not you know white or I don't live in Ohio, right? <laughs> but um, you know I come from a similar background where you know we were poor, right? Um, and uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money. And I I would look at my high school friends, and I whenever I went to their house. I mean, their homes would be huge and massive. And I'm like, like this, like this can't be normal, right? Uh, this amount of wealth, like this is amazing. So, so I'm actually really genuinely curious uh, when it comes to your coin laundry, I know you see it. I see, I see you posting it all the time on Facebook uh, and you're, you're like, that's your like pride and joy, right? Your coin laundry. Oh, yeah. um, w how different is it to manage a coin laundry versus say a residential rental? Cause I, Residential rental and multifamily is the only experience I have. I've never gone down to the whole vending machine or, or a coin laundry. What, what is that like? Where, where, do you, where do you draw the differences uh, in terms of managing and owning a coin laundry business? Yeah.
going back to my CEO friend that was the, the CEO of an oil company, he made this recommendation to me. At one time, he was the largest subway owner in all of Southern Ohio. He owned 23 wow. or 24 subways. And he said, Brandon, if you can ever find a business to get into that is not solely dependent on labor, that's a business you need to get into. And that's why he, um, that's why he owned subways. Cause he said, you can run a subway with one person. And if you have two people, you can really do well with subway and knowing how much money this guy was making and his business, this, uh, you know, just, he, he was so wealthy. I mean, it was unbelievable. And he's a nice guy, nicest guy I know, ultra wealthy. Yeah, one as an instance, um, his he told me my wife and I finally decided what we're doing for Christmas, and you know this was probably the first year I was in real estate, and I said, so you know what does a multimillionaire do for Christmas? And he said, well, we're finding we found a local school, and we are um, sponsoring ten kids for the next school year, wow. and I, the school's five thousand dollars a year, and so him and his wife's Christmas celebration was to um, pony up fifty thousand dollars to give the kids. And he said, then we'll, we'll probably go to Columbus and we'll have a nice dinner somewhere. And I thought, man, you know, I want to be, you know, I know that's, that's kind of a, a, an offshoot of what we're talking about. But whenever he talked, I would very much listen. Mm -hmm. So when I started running into these laundromats that um, I would go in and they didn't have any people working in them, but there were people spending money. And then that, you know, I kind of hear him saying in my back, get into this, get into this. So um, when I had the opportunity to start buying laundromats, I thought this is a business that I can automate, that I can scale, and it's not going to be dependent on me hiring a hundred people to do. I know people that are very tied to labor, and if one person quits, their 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 life's over. Um, so it's been a learning process because it's a cash business, um, way more so than rentals. Um, I have to deal with equipment. Um, I have to deal with people. But the people aspect's not worse than dealing with low income rentals because I have a lot of cheap properties um, yeah. where I live. And, you know, just kind of the stories I hear and having to deal with people trying to take money from me. That's that's just something I deal with managing real estate and being a landlord. But then the 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 learning about laundry has been kind of weird because I don't do laundry. I mean, I've probably done two loads of laundry my entire adult life. <laughs> so going from never doing laundry to owning a laundromat, I've had to <laughs> learn a lot. And there's this kind of um, side to where you have to learn about the machine. Um, some of these machines I have in the laundromat, they're from the 70s. So they're older than I am, which is kind wow. of neat. I own something older than you and it still works. But then I also have to figure out, you know, what's the most efficient way to deal with this equipment? Should I, um, you know, should I depreciate it? Should I buy new equipment? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're looking at a remodel buying equipment that uh, is app capable and will send a text message to your phone when your clothes are done. Um, cool. and the bid I got, is like a hundred and five hundred and ten thousand dollars um, which is more money than I've ever spent on a house. I mean, um, like I said, the, the, the deal we're closing on tomorrow is more than, uh, more than a hundred thousand dollars, but, uh, it is, yeah, it's a big deal. So, but dealing right. with the laundromat, you know, I've never had to deal with a pure equipment. There's no real estate involved in that hundred and five thousand dollar transaction, but going back to what I said about negotiating, um, just learning to negotiate with people, this laundromat that I picked up, the seller financed the, almost the entirety of the purchase. Wow. We only put we only put fifteen thousand down Holy on smokes. the laundromat. Yeah, so fifteen thousand dollars to buy a laundromat, and through my spying and going back, I called the um, the water department in town. I said, "Hey, I'm looking at buying a property. Can you give me the water reports." And um, they told me how many gallons of water it used a month. So I sat down with my kids. I took pictures of the data plates on the washers. And we had a uh, algebra lesson with my kids on how much money did this laundromat used to make. <laughs> working the water consumption back on a per load basis average profit. Um, so that's not really difficult to do if you want to figure out how much, uh, at least income, the washers made. Right. Um, so at the, in the heyday, the laundromat was making between eight, eight and nine thousand dollars a month uh, revenue, and you think, well, that's you know about a hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue for a laundromat, and I can sell or find, I can get it with fifteen thousand dollars down, and have the seller carry back an actual mortgage on the property as a purchase money mortgage rather than like a lease option. Okay. Um, so, yeah, going back to negotiation, it's nice to be able to put those deals together and talk to people. So yeah. 
Dude, yeah, you're, you're getting me excited about this concept because A, you're, you're not dealing with people day-to-day basis and it's not where people live, right? It's where people go and drop off their bad laundry. And um, th- that got me intrigued because now I'm thinking, wow, like you can generate $100,000 revenue without ever having to deal with tenants, right? I mean, you're I mean, here in Illinois, if you want to generate $100,000 revenue for rent, I mean, depending where you are, um, you're looking at a 10 unit maybe, eight unit, 10 unit, right? Um, and that's eight to 10 people or family that you have, you're having to constantly deal with. Uh, and of course, even with the property management company, you're still hearing about some of the problems. Uh, but with the laundromat, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so what does your expenses look like? Now, of course, if you're, if you're talking about residential rental, you know, we got the factor of, you know, you got to pay property taxes, you got you got the management cost, uh, you got maintenance expenses, um, insurance, right? So uh, let's say on a hundred thousand dollar revenue, how much do you think is 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 actual expenses as far as just keeping the the uh, laundromat going? Just from what I've seen talking to guys, as long yeah. as you're talking about non debt expenses, right? Non debt expenses, yeah, yeah. Because um, equipment, I get that hundred thousand dollar, hundred five thousand dollar loan. It's at like a seven year loan, so it's like a giant car loan. Okay. So you're paying a lot of money out of cash flow to pay the, for the equipment. Right. But for like utilities, utilities, um, basic insurance, things like that, the big costs in the laundry industry, most of the people I talk to say about 35 to 40% of your revenue that comes in goes to your- You said 30, 30, 30%? 30, 30, 35%. It's very dependent on how your local municipality charges for water. Because right. the number one expense in laundromats is water, far beyond anything else. But then there's new washers out there that will wash an entire load of laundry on eight gallons of water. So hmm. then it becomes a play of, you know, do you want to load yourself up on equipment costs and debt? Or do you want to load yourself up on um, water costs by having cheaper I equipment? Um, I don't deal with lease agreements. I have, I have a message every day asking about what do you do about lease agreements? I own the real estate in every location. That's kind of my non, I won't, I would never buy a laundromat unless I own the real estate. Right. But I, I met this guy um, from New York city. He owns a laundromat in a lease location. Um, he brings in $2.9 million a year in his laundromat. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can imagine why. In New York, I mean, it's super urban, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about the density of population and the need for them to clean their dirty clothes, right? There's a high demand for that. Plus, you know, New, New Yorkers want to look great. You know, they don't want to, you know, go down the street wa- walking smelly. <laughs> and that goes into how a laundromat's valued is you look at the yeah. median age structure, like how many buildings were built before 1970. Um, so if they're built before 70, there's a good chance there's not going to be any um, water facilities in there. Um, there's an income thing. You don't want to be under 30,000. You don't want to be over 60,000, at least for Ohio. So there's, you know, there's all these levels of fluctuation, um, with it, but then people that are in larger areas, they can make way more money than I can as far as revenue goes, but then they're tied to a lease. And I talked to one guy that bought a laundromat based on my YouTube videos, which just blows my mind that someone would go all in on a laundromat in South Carolina because they watched some random guy's YouTube videos, but he sent me the financial statement on this laundromat and it makes way more money than mine does. Um, it's in pretty good location, but then he said, what do I do about lease negotiation? Because it's a 3.5% a year escalation clause. I said, Holy crap. You're the, you're that landlord's cash cow, aren't you? He said, what do you mean? I said, I would never sign a lease that has a 3.5% a year escalation. Um, he, his, he was expected 10 years from now to be paying 10,000 a month on rent. Jeez, um, so $120,000 for in lease fees for his laundromat. I said, you know, the building that that laundromat's in, um, sold four years ago for $600,000. I said, your one unit is a multi-unit, um, facility, um, apartments, uh, apartments above, um, uh, retail space below. So you're paying, your one unit's paying his entirety of his mortgage. Um, so he took that piece of information and he got renegotiated for 0% escalation clauses over the next 10 years, which went making the laundromat from an okay deal to a really great one. And the, the owner that was selling it kind of got mad because he sold it based on the assumption the, lo- the landlord would never budge. Ah. And... Um, 
he told the guy, he said, look, you are stripping equity and revenue or equity and net income from this laundromat. He's going to go broke in 10 years. And then your guy, your guy that's paying for your mortgage is going to uh, be gone. And then you're going to be screwed on this rental or this facility. And the landlord said, yep, you're right. I agree. 10 years, um, no escalation. So he, he's, from what I can tell, the laundromat is going to be a really good deal for him. But lease negotiation is one of those things that I just, I don't have an interest in dealing with because I can buy the underlying real estate and I just haven't seen too many deals where that's not an issue. But I'm outside Columbus, Ohio, and um, right. our world's different. It's, I'm sure it's different than Chicago is. Oh, so. yeah. I mean, Chicago is getting super urbanized every year. It's it's unbelievable. And, and I think you're in a good business. Um, it, 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 there are more and more millennials today are getting urbanized, right? They're moving back to the city. Um, no longer do they want to live with their mom and pops in the suburbs. Um, you know, they want to move back to the city where their friends are at, where all the social life is happening. Um, so I think there's a serious, serious demand for more and more laundromats, right? As, as, as much as more multifamily is being developed, um, especially in a places like Chicago, LA, New York, right? Uh, there's, there might be a serious challenge where people may have, you know, can't wash their dirty clothes, uh, you know, because the population increased. So um, just, just to kind of wrap this up, uh, Brandon, I, I think you gave me a, a lot of gold nuggets. You know, I, I've, I've been intrigued by the laundromat business, um, you, you know, looking at your Facebook posts, right? Uh, looking through your, your pictures and, and your YouTube videos. I was very intrigued, along with the machine that counts coins. Uh, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Brandon, it's been um, such a, a, a great time just getting to know your business and of course who you are. Um, so any last parting words for any other investors? Let, let's say, you know, new investors are going to get into laundromat business. What would you say or give them a, a, as a final little advice? Well, I, I, my big thing is knowledge is a one way street. Um, if you dedicate yourself to learning something new every day and dedicate yourself to, to be willing to invest a lot of time in something, mm -hmm. um, that's a one way street. Um, I've asked the guys that I look up to, the guys that they're in their early 60s, mid 60s, they've got yeah. seven, you know, eight figures of net worth. So they're in the 10 to $50 million range. And I've asked every single one of them, what is the difference between someone who makes it to your level of success and the average Joe? And they said, the, the people that make it in this industry, meaning real estate, um, they are okay with waiting 20 years. Mm. They're okay with waiting a long time for their success. And as time goes on, I continue to agree with those that that idea 100%. None of this mm -hmm. stuff's going to get going to happen overnight. Real estate is not a rich quick scheme, mm -hmm. a get rich quick scheme. Uh, it's a get rich quick slow scheme, and it'll <laughs> work. It's just you have to be willing to wait. Right. And so many people just aren't willing to wait. I've got I've got a dozen stories about guys who were willing to wait. And they made all the money in the world. And I've also got guys that had the world handed to them on a golden platter and they just weren't willing to wait and they lost it all. I bought, right. you know, 24 units off an elderly gentleman and his son just did not want to wait. And he ran his dad's $1.2 million rental business into the ground. And guess who bought it? Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's we live in an interesting disparity where you know the rest of society we live in this microwave mentality, right? Where we're like, hey, you know, in thirty minutes I need to get my ten thousand dollar check, or you know, I'm gonna go in and make sure that I mean, literally, we can get any information and video entertainment, everything that we need right here on the phone, right? And and in the real estate investing business, it takes years to develop you know value and income and revenue and. Uh, or to be able to pay down a property, and there's that huge disparity where people, you know, we're living in a society where it's so we're so fast paced. But here's a business where it takes time, right? It takes effort, it takes investment, it takes a lot of, uh, you know, patience to see revenue. Um, so I would say that's a that's a phenomenal advice for anyone just getting started with this, you know, with an expectation that they're going to be a billionaire next year and they're going to run for president and uh, they're going to build a wall on the Can Canadian border. <laughs> right. And, and the problem is like with real estate, there's always people out there. I've, I've met people that have made all the right. money in the world overnight. And yeah, that does happen. And those are the stories that get all the publicity and all the press. When you talk to a guy that's been in real estate for 30 years and you know, he's made $5 million, he's got a $5 million net worth today. People, those kind of stories don't go around the world. But uh, when a guy flips a house on TLC and makes a hundred thousand dollars, you know, those are the kinds of people I run into nonstop. And yeah. I, 
I'm the president of a real estate investor association and we get people every single month that come to our meetings. How do I get rich quick, Brandon? Right. Well, sorry, you're, you know, yes, there's a bunch of millionaires in the room, but no one's going to tell you how to make that money overnight. We can tell you how to yeah. make it in 10 years. Well, the, the truth is actually, uh, we got interviewed to, to do a show um, for, for one of these big networks. I'm not going to mention which, which one, but um, we, we found the, um, we found the, 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 the truth right behind these shows. A lot of them are fabricated. Um, I hate to burst the bubble, uh, but you know, a lot of them is acting. A lot of it is just buying a house and renovating it. And the way that people make money on that is, is simply sponsorships, right? Uh, the network pays them to, to put on a show. Uh, and a lot of times they're not even real flips. So um, I know a lot of people watch HTTV or TLC or whatever, and they're like, oh my gosh, like they spent 10 minutes and made $100,000, right? I'm like, well, not really. Um, you know, it's a lot of acting. It's a lot of, um, you know, just making sure that they look great. Uh, but, you know, none of it is actually real, right? So um, that's, unfortunately, that's the expectation that these shows kind of create, um, you know, when it, comes to the, uh, when it comes to the whole concept of fix and flipping and real estate investing in general. So, um, Brandon, appreciate you being on the show. Really, really, really do. I've learned something. I was intrigued. I hope you guys learned something as well for those who are watching. All right, everybody, take care. And then make sure um, there's a video that we just published um, last week, how to pay off your uh, the mortgage rates, the truth about mortgage rates. Make sure you click on this video right here and watch the video, the truth about mortgage rates. I'll see you guys in the next video.